Christ did everything that was necessary for us to be able to enjoy uh, forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Mm -hmm. There was no other way. Let me see if I can get this hooked in the way it's supposed to be and turned on the way it's supposed to be. And we'll be set to go. All right. For all of you parents out there, you know that that's a very scary moment when your kids are standing up in front of people with microphones and there's not much you can do to change whatever happens <laughs> between the time they speak and it goes out and listens to everybody. So. Hey, it is good to see you back tonight. Glad that you're here. Thanks so much for coming, and I'm looking forward to a good service here tonight. Let's take our Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of John, the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at uh, one of the most familiar verses in all of the Bible, John in chapter number 3, and then we're, we're going to look at um, several verses surrounding John 3 and verse number 16, but we'll key in tonight on verse number 16 from the book of John, chapter number 3. And once you found it, um, then you can look up here, and then I'll take a moment and just ask the Lord to help us here tonight, and we'll look together at this passage. Hey, again, thanks for coming tonight. I hope you'll come to every service you can this week. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Thursday night at Miami Beach, 7 o'clock. And uh, Friday night, same thing. Miami Beach, 7 o'clock. And, hey, if, you're, if your prayer life needs help, then take Pastor up on his offer to ride with him to Miami Beach. I'm telling you, it will help your prayer life. No, I'm just kidding. A very safe driver most of the time. And uh, I'm sure it'll be great. Let's take a moment and let's talk to the Lord. I'm going to ask God to help me because there's nothing that I can do to convince anyone of anything, but I need God's help tonight. So let me ask God to help um, me speak and you ask God to help you listen. All right. Father, I love you, and I am so grateful to you just for the opportunity to be able to gather together. Father, I really am grateful for this group that's come together tonight. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would please help me to say exactly what you want me to say. 
and that you would take it and you would drive it into the heart and mind, into the conscience of every person that's here. So that every person leaves so thoroughly convinced of what, of what your son said when he was here on this earth. That, that there's no way they could leave with a doubt in their mind about the truthfulness and the accuracy of what is said here and the fact that it is directed for each of us. So I need your help. In fact, I need you to do this. And I, I do ask for it again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thanks again, Father. Help me please. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. John chapter 3 is one of the most familiar verses. John 3, 16, that is, is one of the most familiar verses in all of the Bible. And it's surrounded by a number of other verses that are, um, that are super helpful just in understanding what is being said. So we're going to start in John 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 14, and we'll read all the way down to the end of verse number 18. So John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 14, and we start here with a uh, reminder. Jesus is speaking. If you have a Bible that has the words of Jesus Christ in red letters, then you'll see that this is in red because Christ is speaking. And in speaking, he is reminding the person to whom he's speaking about something that had taken place way back in the Old Testament times when the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they had complained against God and complained against Moses and God had sent into their midst a group of fiery serpents who began to bite the people because of their wickedness, because of their sin of complaint against God. And the people come to Moses and they say, Moses, help us, please help us out of this situation. Moses goes to God, says, God, the people are in trouble, they're sorry, can you please help? And God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to take some brass and make it look like the serpent that is biting these people put it up on a pole, and everybody that looks at that serpent up on that pole will be saved. If they have been bitten, they will not die. They'll be rescued. Um, they'll be forgiven. And so it's that story that, that John, uh, Jesus rather reminds a man by the name of Nicodemus as he speaks to him. Verse 14 says, And as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness... Even so, just like that, must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, won't die, but instead have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now these are some power-packed verses. John 3.16 specifically is the central part of this passage, and is the central theme of the entire scripture, the Bible. In a nutshell, this verse gives to us God's plan for all of us being able to be rescued, just like the people of Israel were rescued when they would look at the serpent that was made out of brass after they had been bitten. John 3.16 is the verse where Jesus, using the comparison of the serpent and of the people, and uh, Moses having lifted up that serpent on that pole, Mo Jesus uses that as an example, and he says, okay, just like that, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, Jesus is, he says, just like that, the Son of Man must also be lifted up. And then he says, for God so loved the world. Now let me stop just for a second and say this. In the Bible, there are certain statements that when you read them, it's almost mind-boggling. Mind-blowing. When I read this statement, this is one of the most amazing statements in all of the Bible, that God loves the world. Right. I mean, when he says, when the Bible says God loves the world, you understand that he's not talking about um, God loving terra firma, God loving the dirt or the trees, though God does love his creation. 
But when the scriptures say that God loves the world, it's talking about the people of the world. Well, you say, why is that so amazing? I mean, didn't God create us? Well, yes. But the fact that God loves us is amazing to me because of what I know about me. And because I know it about me, I know it about you. And because you know it about me, you know it about you. And that is the fact that all of us are sinners. In fact, this, this verse gives to us everything that we need to know and understand so that we can know beyond any doubt that when we die that our sins have been forgiven and that we will spend forever with God in a place called heaven. And there are three truths taught in this verse that I want to share with you tonight. And the first one comes from the first phrase. That we, just, that we just talked about. For God so loved the world, that that is amazing. And here's the first truth. And forgive me, I don't mean to treat you like children, um, but repetition is the key to learning. So I'm going to give to you the truth that we're going to learn, and then I'm going to invite you to say it back to me. And that's just, just so that this time is valuable where you, where you learn what it is that God has for us to learn tonight. The first truth is this. First truth is, I am a sinner and I need help. Let me give it again. First truth is, I am a sinner and I need help. I'll give it one more time because some of you are uh, looking a little bit dazed. One more time. Truth number one is, I am a sinner, I need help. Let's try it together. Here we go. Ready? Truth number one, I am a sinner and I need help. Okay, so the Bible says, for God so loved the world, which is amazing to me, because I know about me what you know about you, and that is that you and I are sinners. Sin is anything that we think or say or do that doesn't please God. The deal is, God is the standard of what is right. The Bible says about God um, that He is holy. That means He is set apart from anything that is wrong. He's perfect. So anything that displeases or goes against God would be considered a sin or something that, is, that transgresses, that steps over the line of what is right and holy because God is the standard of everything that is holy. So God gives to us in His Word things that let us know about us that we are sinners. For instance, God says in His Word that I'm not supposed to lie or thou shalt not bear false witness, the Bible says. Well, if we were to take an honesty check here tonight and I were to have you raise your hand if you have never, ever, ever, ever been dishonest in your entire life, could anybody in honesty raise their hand and say, I've never been dishonest? Well, no, none of us could because all of us are sinners. Now, let me stop and just say this. When I say that we're all sinners, this is not a social statement. In other words, I'm not saying, hey, you're a sinner, but I'm a preacher. That's, that's, not, that's not what we say at all. When the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it's letting us know that, yes, God already knows about me, and the fact of the matter is, is that you already know about you, and I know about me. This is not me saying, you're a sinner, but I'm okay. You're a sinner, but I'm a Christian. You're a sinner, but I'm a preacher. No, 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 no. We're, we're all in the same condition. Now, let me stop real quickly and say that when I say we're all in the same condition, that's not a place where you're supposed to go, oh, all right, hey, as long as we're all in the same boat, then it's okay, because certainly um, everything will be fine if we're all in the same boat. Have, have, you ever, have you ever said something in a group, and when you said it, I mean, as soon as it came out of your mouth, you were thinking to yourself, I wish I could take that back again. Have you ever said something, and then as soon as you said it, you thought, oh, why did I say that? How many of you have ever said something that afterwards you wished you could take back somehow? All right, I have on a number of occasions said things that as soon as I said it, I thought, I wish there were somewhere near here a small hole I could crawl into and then pull it in on myself so that no one could find me again. And then afterwards, you know, after you make the statement and you go, oh, that was the wrong thing to say right now. So maybe somebody comes up to you a little bit later and says, hey, look, I've done the same thing. I have said things like that before. And you go, oh, well, it doesn't take away all the pain of it, but at least other people have done the same thing. Sometimes we get the relief from our guilt for what we said because other people have done the same thing. Okay, when the Bible says, for all have sinned, it's not like we're supposed to go, oh, all right, well, at least we're all in the same boat. 
This is just a broad statement where God says, look, I know you. I know that you're imperfect. I know that by choice, you have done things that I have said not to do. And the problem with that is God, who is holy, cannot, the Bible says, he cannot and will not allow into his heaven, into his presence, anything or anyone that has sinned. He's perfect. He couldn't allow, it's not as if God can hold his eyes or hold his nose and say, all right, you've done a little bit of bad stuff, but not as bad as other people, so I'll let you in. No, 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 no. That would make the best person on earth the standard for what gets to go to heaven. But the standard for getting to go to heaven is not who is the best among us or who are the better among us or who are the most religious among us. But the standard for getting to go to heaven is who is like God? Who is perfect? And God says to all of us regarding that, not me. I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner and I can't get to God, the Bible says that the wages or the payment for my sin is death. Speaking of separation forever from God and ending up in a place that the Bible calls hell, which is a real place that burns with real fire. So that all those who reject God's way of rescue choose for themselves the way that leads to forever in a burning place called hell. Okay. I'm a sinner. I need help. The fact that God so loved the world is amazing to me because fact number one, I'm a sinner. I need help. Would you say fact one with me one more time? Fact number one, I'm, I'm a, a sinner, sinner and I need help. help. And that is true. The second truth that I see from John 3.16 is this. Here's the truth. Truth number two is, Jesus is God and he can help me. Listen again. Truth two is, Jesus is God and he can help me. Let's try it. Here we go. Truth number two. Jesus is God and he can help me. Let's try it once more. Truth number two. Jesus is God and he can help me. I'm going to really work on your memory. Number one, I'm a sinner. I need help. Truth number two, Jesus is God and he can help me. Okay, back to the verse. Look at it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That is amazing because I'm a sinner and I need help. Then it says that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, important words in this phrase. Only begotten son. Only begotten means a special kind. Different than any other son that has ever been born. Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. Why is that significant? Well, you know, you, of course, we just came through the Christmas season, and you know the real, the real meaning to Christmas, don't you? I mean, I'm all about, I enjoy presents, and I enjoy time and family, and I enjoy putting on the extra lard so that on Wednesdays we can weigh in and then get rid of the lard throughout the rest of the year. I'm for all of that. I think it's a great plan. However, the true meaning of Christmas is the birth of Jesus Christ. And the birth of Jesus Christ is significant in history, and it's significant to us tonight because the birth of Jesus Christ reveals, or it begins to show how special Jesus Christ really is. For instance, the Bible says about Jesus that he was born of a virgin. Here's Mary, who was espoused or engaged to a man named Joseph. Forgive me, I'll be as appropriate as possible. But they had not yet consummated the marriage, and she's found with child. Now, she and Joseph um, get married so that there's no, so that there's not uh, a scandal that goes on in the community around. But the baby that is in the womb of Mary isn't Joseph's baby. The father of Jesus is God. That is, God put inside of Mary this, this boy who's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the son of the God. He had flesh, yes. He got tired, yes. He got hungry, yes. But this Jesus is also God. He, is, he had existed throughout all of eternity, but he came to earth 2,000 years ago. Now, Jesus Christ did things all throughout his life 
that helped to give exclamation point to the fact that he is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, God in flesh. Um, Jesus Christ healed people, people who had lame legs. He touched their legs and they were healed. He uh, touched the ears of the deaf and they could hear. Touched the eyes of the blind, they could see. The tongue of the dumb, they could speak. On one occasion, we're told that Jesus came to the tomb of a man who had been dead for four days, and he called the man's name, and he says, Lazarus, that's the man's name, Lazarus, come forth. And a man who had been dead for four days walked out of the tomb alive again. Okay, doctors can't do that. There's, no, there's nobody alive that can do that. But Jesus Christ could and did because Jesus Christ is God. He was special, different. People came and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who recognized who he was bowed before him and, and gave him honor because Jesus Christ is the Son of the God. Now, to me, this is just my mind thinking. I'm thinking to myself, um, here's, here's Jesus who heals the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the lame, calls the dead back to life again, takes five loaves of bread and two fish and breaks it and feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. I'm thinking to myself, who's not going to like this guy? Okay, just think for a second. How many of you would like a friend who can do all the things that Jesus did? Wouldn't you like somebody who, uh, okay, all right, all right, all right, here we go. <clears throat> Those of you who are over 35 years of age. <laughs> How many of you would like you if the Lord Jesus, or if you had a friend, rather, who could touch your eyes and make you see like you did when you were 10 years of age? Would you like that? I, I wear contacts. I have a positive 4.25. If I had glasses on, they would be this thick. Um, I, I, would, I would love it. I would love it if in the morning I did not need to put in contacts. I would love it if I could hear like I used to be able to hear. I have voice issues that I have to deal with all the time. I would love to have a friend who could go and have every, everything back, I mean, taken care of. Or a friend who you could bring a, a medium pizza to this meal. He bless it and you can eat as much as you want it. And what's more, he could probably take away the calories if he wanted to. All right. So, I mean, wouldn't, you like, wouldn't it be great to have a friend like that? So I'm thinking to myself, now forgive the simplicity of my mind, but I'm a simple person. I'm thinking to myself, here's Jesus, who people saw. This is not like hearsay. People saw all of these things take place. I'm thinking, there's a person everybody's going to like. And yet there were people that hated the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that because of jealousy, they came and they took the Lord Jesus Christ, handed him over to a group of soldiers, and the soldiers then beat the Lord Jesus Christ so badly that he didn't even look like a man. They had a mock trial where a mob gathered together and called out for the blood of, of Jesus. The man in charge, a man by the name of Pilate, said, he's done nothing wrong, I need to let him go. And the mob, led by the religious leaders, cried out, let him be crucified, his blood be on us and our children, but let him be crucified, kill him. And so Pilate, not willing to anger the people, washes his hands and says, fine, take him and, and kill him. And so they place a cross on the back of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, who had lost blood and being beaten, drugged the cross as far as he could, fell beneath the weight. Someone else picks up the cross, carries it. They lay it at the foot of a hill called Calvary or Golgotha. And the Lord Jesus Christ lays down on the cross, and listen, and he spreads out his hand. In my mind's eye, I see as a soldier grabs the wrist of Jesus Christ, pulls it out, takes a spike, sticks it into his hand, and then hammers the spike through his hand and into that wood. On the other side, another soldier grabs his other wrist and he pulls it this way and puts a spike into his hand and then drives the spike through the hand and into the piece of wood. One foot perhaps placed on the other and a spike driven through both feet and then into the cross, and the cross is lifted up and dropped down into a hole where Jesus Christ 
the Son of the God, God in flesh, the perfect one who had never sinned, who is the only one who has ever earned the right to be able to be with the Father in heaven because He's perfect. This Jesus, instead of taking what He earned, heaven, the Bible says, listen to this, this is important. The Bible says that He, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us when he died on that cross. That is, Jesus took the punishment of my sin. My lies in that moment were placed on Jesus Christ. He was dying. He was, he was separated from the Father when the Bible says that, that, that God turned his back and forsook him. Jesus, here's how we know Jesus on the, cry, on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that for the first time in eternity past, and the only time in eternity future, the Father turned his back and would not look at his Son. And Jesus literally, literally suffered hell on the cross when he took my sin on him. My lies, get that. My blasphemy against God. My taking God's name in vain. That's, that's what Christ was paying for. My disobedience and disregard for my parents and authority and the things that God has set up for my good. All of my sin and breaking God's law was put on Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And the Bible says that Jesus' death on the cross was a big word. Here we go a substitutionary death, meaning that he was my substitute. He stood in my place. I deserved to be separated from the Father. I deserve hell. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, took it. In fact, the Bible says that when the Father saw what took place, here, listen to these words, it pleased the Father. Oh, not like he was going, oh good, that's what I wanted to happen. But meaning, it satisfied what had to happen in order for the sins that I have to be paid for. Yeah, I'm a sinner and I need help. I'm a sinner, I deserve death. But Jesus is God. And he can help me because he died on the cross in my place. Do you mind saying the facts with me again? Fact number one, I'm a sinner and I need help. Fact number two, Jesus is God and he can help me. Now fact number three, and then our time is finished. The last fact is this. If I believe, God will save me. Listen again. Fact number three is, if I believe, God will save me. That, that, that promise is found here. I'm going to show it to you. I'll say it again, and then we'll say it together. Verse number 16 of John 3 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that, now look at this, whosoever believeth in Him, speaking of the Son, Jesus Christ, should not perish. doesn't have to die and go to hell but instead have everlasting life. Whoa. So that the difference between those who perish and those who have everlasting life is whoever believes on Jesus has everlasting life, whoever rejects Jesus Christ then doesn't have everlasting life. And the next verse reiterates it, verse 18 rather, says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So fact number three is, if I believe, God will save me. Can we try it? Here we go. Fact number three. If, if I, I believe, believe God, God will, will save, save me. It's two phrases. Let me say it one more time. If I believe, God will save me. Here we go. Fact number three. If, if I, I believe, believe God, God will, will save me. me. That's the truth. Okay. So then the deal becomes, all right, what does it mean to believe? Um, is believe just a matter of me going, ah, I think that's true. If I said, if I said to you, if I said to you tonight, hey, did you know that if you give me three chainsaws, turn them on, crank them up, I can juggle those chainsaws. How many of you would say, Tim, I believe you. I believe you could really do that. 
Yeah, yeah, some of you would just for the sake of seeing me do it um, and see my arm come off or something like that. But uh, sometimes we think of the word believe as, um, yeah, I think that's true. But when the Bible uses the word believe, it's talking about um, belief in the sense of trusting in or relying on. Let me give you an illustration that I may have used here before, but it's one of my favorites just to show um, what, it, what it means to believe. Now, this is a made-up story. This did not happen. This is pretend. But it's an illustration, okay? Let's pretend that my family lives in a two-story house. And Seth's bedroom is upstairs in this house. So are the other boys, but they're younger, five and two. So they still sleep downstairs near Brittany and I, so we can get to them if we need to. But Seth, he's 10, he sleeps upstairs. In the middle of the night, I wake up about, about midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, and I smell smoke. And I say, oh, something's not right. So I wake up Brittany. I say, hey, Brittany, go get the other boys, and I'm going to go up and get Seth. Something's not right. i, I got to get I got to get us out of here. So <laughs> Seth, uh, Brittany gets out of bed, goes and gets Samuel and Asher. That's our two younger ones. And she goes outside. I come out of our bedroom, through the kitchen, around into the living room where the stairs to, up, to the upstairs um, are. And I find out the reason why I was smelling smoke is because the stairs are already on fire, and there's no way I can get up to where Seth is. So immediately, I dart out the front door. As I lean out on the sidewalk, I bend down and I grab a handful of gravel and I run around to where Seth's bedroom window is and I start taking rocks and I'm throwing them at the window, waking up, trying to wake up Seth. I'm throwing them at the window and say, Hey, Seth, Seth, Seth Avery, wake up. Hey, pal. Hey, Seth, you got to wake up. Seth Avery, wake up right now, pal. Wake up. And I'm yelling at Seth in, in the middle of the night. Well, a groggy Seth walks over to the window and he looks down and he sees me. So he reaches up and he unlocks the window and he pulls open the window. Well, when he pulls open the window, the air comes in and pulls the fire that was outside his door, under his door, and lights his room on fire. Oh. Now I'm staring at Seth and I'm saying, Seth, look at me. Hey, Seth, here's what, Seth, look at me, not the fire. Look at me. Here's what you've got to do. Right now, I want you to sit on the windowsill. Get, sit out on the windowsill. Put your bottom on the windowsill and let your feet hang over and look at me. So Seth climbs out of the window and he's sitting on the windowsill. He's up on the second story. I'm down on the ground and I'm saying, Seth, listen to me. Hey, pal, look at me. Hey, what I need is I need you to jump to me. I'm going to catch you. You jump and put your arms out and I will catch you. Seth, look at me. I need you to jump right now. That fire's getting hot and it's getting closer to you. Look at me and jump to me, pal. I have never dropped you before. I am not going to drop you now. Jump to me, Seth, and I will catch you. Jump, Seth. Jump. Well, it's a long ways down, and Seth is scared, understandably. But now the fire has come in his bedroom across. It's a, it got his bed on fire, and he can feel the heat against his back. And I am pleading with Seth. Seth, you've got to jump. Jump, Seth. Jump. And finally, in desperation, Seth puts his hands on the windowsill and he pushes off the windowsill and he begins to fall. At that moment, Seth is totally trusting me to do something for him that he could not do for himself. If I miss Seth, or if I were to step back and put my hands behind my back. Seth has no ability to save himself from this fall. When he pushes off, he is trusting that I am going to do exactly what I said. He, he has believed on me. He's <laughs> trusted me. Okay, now listen. When the Bible says that whosoever believeth in Christ, won't perish, but have everlasting life. The word believe is simply a word that explains what happens when a person makes the decision of, I can't save me. If I die with my sin, I know what I'm getting. Lord Jesus, you said that you died for my sins and I am convinced that you can save me from my sins and you can save me from the penalty of my sins. And a person who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ in essence says, I let go of anything I think 
might get me to heaven on my own. And I trust Jesus Christ and Him completely to save me from my sins. Okay, now let me tell you something. Jesus Christ has never dropped anybody. Every person that has ever made the decision of, I can't save me. Lord Jesus Christ, will you please save me? Every person that has accepted Jesus Christ as their only Savior, Jesus Christ has saved. He promises it here. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Another verse in the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Huh. Well, somebody says, Tim, are you sure it works? I am. Two specific reasons I'll share. Number one, because Jesus Christ saved me from my sins. He said He would. He did. The second reason is, after Jesus Christ died on the cross, for three days He was in a tomb. And on that third day, on a Sunday morning, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And He was seen of over 500 people so that there's no doubt but that it happened. And when Jesus Christ came back to life, it was His saying, in essence, look, I am who I claim to be, and what I have done on the cross is enough. Because it stands to reason that if Jesus Christ is strong enough to save Himself from death, then He's strong enough to save you from your sin, which brings death. So the question becomes, hey, have you ever made the decision to accept Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? Have you ever come to the place where you said, nothing that I can do can get me to heaven? Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. When I was a young boy, I, I made the decision to accept Jesus Christ. Well, you say, how... How much of a sinner can a young boy be? Well, that means you don't have children. Because young boys um, are certainly selfish and can lie and all kinds of things. Yeah, and I, I was guilty of all of that. But somebody told me about who Jesus Christ was and what Jesus Christ had done. And I, decide, I made the decision. I, I can't save me. I know I can't. But Lord Jesus, you said that you would. And all of my faith, all of my dependence is on Christ and Christ alone. I'm going to heaven when I die, not because I'm a good person or a preacher, not because I come to this church or go to a different church. I'm going to heaven when I die because Jesus Christ is strong enough to save me from my sins, and I'm trusting Him. And gladly would I fall into the arms of the Lord Jesus when He promises that He'll save, He will. So, have you made that decision? Well, if not then why not tonight? If you're convinced that fact number one, you're a sinner and you need help, and you believe that Jesus is God and He can help you, then why, why not tonight say, I put my trust in Christ, and then you can know that you have eternal life. Fact number one, I'm a sinner. I need help. Fact number two, Jesus is God. He can help me. Fact number three, if I believe, God will save me. Amen. And they'll save you too. So let's do this. Here's, here's what we do at this church. Oftentimes we give what we call an invitation, which is just a time when I would like to invite people who would like to trust Christ to do just exactly that. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that right where you sit, you can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. You can trust Him. Now, if you have questions about some things, or if something doesn't make sense to you, that's the reason why we are here. That's the reason why Pastor Price is here. Look, honestly, honestly, if you have questions or even arguments, as long as they're not arguments just for the sake of arguing, then it's absolutely fine for you to come and question or come, come and talk to us. Honestly, we, we would love, all we're going to do is take the Bible and say, here's what God says. It's not me. It's what God says. 
And so it would be our privilege to be able to sit down and answer questions. But please, please, just, just consider who God is and who you are. Who Christ is and what He did. And consider the significance of accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. Well, somebody might say, I don't want to accept Him, but I don't reject Him either. It doesn't work that way. By not accepting, you, you, you understand, you do reject, at least for now. And, and I, I would sure hate for anybody to leave that way. God doesn't want you to. So, if you'd like to trust Christ, you can, you can tonight, and I hope that you will. Let's ask God to help us to understand, and then I'm going to invite anybody who has questions or anybody that would like to trust Christ to, uh, to meet with Pastor and let him get you connected with somebody who can answer questions and help you with it. Or, if you're convinced of all these things and in your seat you'd like to just say, Lord Jesus, I can't save me. Will you please save me? And put your trust in him. Then you can do that as well. Let's talk to God. Father, I'm grateful tonight for the promises of your word and no promise is greater huh, than the promise that whosoever believeth in Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life. Lord Jesus, thank you for making the provision, for being my substitute, for standing in the place of the punishment that I deserve. I'm so grateful to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for saving me. I do pray for every person that's here to be fully convinced of their need, of um, Father, of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And if any have questions, answer them. Please turn on the light for them. I pray that you would that you would um, solidify in their hearts and minds the decision that needs to be made. And then as some come to you right now and accept your son as a savior, God, please do what you promised. I know you will. Please save. Please do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. And thank you for the opportunity to believe on him. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I wonder if tonight, just a couple of questions. Number one, I wonder who tonight would say, Tim, I'm already convinced, I'm convinced of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. And right now in my seat, I would like, I would like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm convinced of what the Bible says here, of who Christ is, what he did. I'm convinced that I need that. And right now, I'd like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'd say, um, Tim, could you please pray with me? Not, not, now don't embarrass me, please. But could you please pray with me and help and ask God to help me to understand and to be able to trust Christ. I wonder if there's some that would say by an upraised hand, Tim, that's me, that's where I am. And you'd slip up your hand. Are there, are there any like that that you'd like to trust Christ right now? And, and you're convinced of who Christ is and you'd like to trust Christ? I'll wait just for a moment. Okay, second question. I wonder how many tonight would say, Tim, um, I'm close to wanting to trust Christ, but there's still some questions I need to get answered. And you'd say, please don't embarrass me, but please, um, Tim, would you please pray that I will get my questions answered and that I will find the truth. I want the truth. And you'd say, please help me to be able to find the truth. Is there anybody like that? You'd say, I still have questions about this matter. Anyone like that? Just slip up your hand. And again, I won't embarrass you. I promise I won't. I'll just pray for you. Okay. Last question is this. How many would say by an upraised hand, Tim, I know that I have eternal life because I have put my faith in Christ and Christ alone. That is a decision that I have already made. And you'd say by an upraised hand, as a testimony to God's grace in my life, I know that my sins are forgiven because I am trusting in Christ and Christ alone. And you'd say, as a testimony to God's grace, that's something that's already settled in my heart. Is that true for you? you just look, well, a number of you have. Well, God bless you. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, then let's, let's do this. Let's take a moment and just talk to the Lord and thank Him for what He has done in providing for us eternal life. And then, after I'm finished, I'm just going to have a stand in a moment. I'm going to have a stand, and Brittany's going to play through a song on the piano with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you would like to be saved, if you'd like to trust Christ, or if you have questions about it, while she is playing in a moment, I want to invite you to come and see either myself or Pastor Price, and let us take you to a... So somewhere that's private where you can get questions answered and you can, you can trust Christ tonight. And we sure would love to be able to help you with it. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, please take your truth and drive it into the hearts and minds of those who are here. God, please, please, you, you turn on the lights for folks, please. 
We love you, Lord. We're grateful for what you've provided for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Now, if you're physically able, would you mind stand, standing with me? As you stand, would you just keep your eyes closed just for a moment while Brittany plays through a stanza of an invitation hymn. And if you'd like to trust Christ tonight, or if you have questions about it, while she plays and people's eyes are closed, would you come either to the front to see me or in the back of the auditorium is Pastor Price, and we'd love to be able to help you with it as Brittany begins to play. Mm -hmm.